Hi, this is Stephanie Miller from The Stephanie Miller Show. Please enjoy this exclusive clip from my show on Political Voices Network. <laughs> well, we always have to start with Wolverines. But anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Also, I totally forgot your husband is from my hometown of Lockport, New York. Lockport, to... New York. Yep, got a chance to visit there this weekend. What a beautiful town. And all my friends, from high school friends from Lockport, were here out yeah. today for a wedding. Um Small world, we have so much to talk about. I do honestly not even know where to start, but I think because you're a university professor, we have to start, I think, with the Supreme Court's just egregious action, you know, affirmative action, student loan. It, start wherever you'd like to start, because I know you have a ne- unique view, I'm sure, of it. Yeah, both of these opinions are really distressing. I mean, one, they're going to have a terribly adverse effect on minority students and on students who are lower income and need to borrow money to go to college. But, you know, the court is not about the ends. The court is not about the results. The court is about the process. And that's what matters. And so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, as John Roberts likes to say, they call balls and strikes, right? They're not supposed to tinker with the outcome. But if you look at each of these cases, Stephanie, um, it really seems like the court did not stick to the normal process. So first, with regard to affirmative action, Chief Justice Roberts has always had this sort of colorblind view of the world, which is not what the law requires. And I think it's a very common myth that the law requires colorblindness. And it's a, it's a lovely aspiration if we lived in a country without 250 years of slavery, Jim Crow, and discrimination. But what the law says is that the state government may draw lines based on race as long as it is, as it is narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling governmental interest. And the last time the court spoke on this, a case called Grutter versus Bollinger out of the University of Michigan, it said diversity in the classroom is a compelling governmental interest. And so if universities you know, don't have strict quota rules, but they consider race as a plus factor among other factors so that they can achieve the diversity they want in their classrooms to benefit all students, then that's permissible. And here, you know, I think what we saw is the court didn't quite strike that down, but by finding the Harvard and the North Carolina programs unconstitutional, it's hard to see how any affirmative action program would ever be uh, passed past that test. Yeah. So well, we that, have- that really strikes me as instead of following precedent, following p- the policy preferences of the majority of the court. Yeah. Who's... Be- <sighs> They don't strike me as justices yeah. anymore, but right. like Fox News talking points. But so we have these, uh, you know, dueling. Stephen Miller threatens lawsuit against schools who ignore SCOTUS affirmative action. He also apparently believes it's legal to blow up uh, boats full of migrants. Um, but, you know, I, I'm interested in your take on this other. A civil rights group is challenging legacy admissions at Harvard, saying the practice discriminates against students of color by giving an unfair boost to the mostly white children of alumni. I mean, this is something we've known about forever. Right. But they did, you know, they did statistics, right? Seventy percent of Harvard's donor related and legacy applications are white. Being a legacy student makes an uh, an applicant roughly six times more likely to be admitted. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but this seems to me like a a fair case to make that there's still affirmative action for rich white legacy kids. Right. I think that's right, Stephanie. And so this case is brought under a statute, not the Equal Protection Clause, which has that um, compelling governmental interest, narrowly tailored language. This is under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VI. And what that says is, first, a plaintiff has to show that there is some uh, educational program that it has some discriminatory effect. It does not require intent to discriminate, just that it has a disparate impact. And according to this complaint, as you just said, 70% of the beneficiaries of these legacy programs and donor programs are white. So they've made out that case. But then the burden shifts back to the university, the defendant, to say it is an educational necessity to have this program in place. And if they can do that, they can they can prevail. But even Harvard does not say this is any kind of educational necessity. What they say instead is, you know, it's good for community building. It's good because it encourages generous financial support, right? Yeah. We all like donors, right? We all like that. And if people yes. think your kid might get in with a big donation, then bring it on. Um, I think, I, I, you know, the facts are going to matter if they can make up their case. 
But as elections complaint, I think they have a very strong case. I do, too. I, this line, a spot given to a legacy or donor-related applicant is a spot that becomes unavailable to an applicant who meets the admissions criteria based purely on his or own merit. Uh, if the legacy and donor preferences are removed, it adds more students of color. Uh, it, uh, it adds more students of color would be admitted to Harvard. I mean, you know, Jody and I had our own stories. Jody's mom is Carol Burnett who went to UCLA. Jody applied to UCLA, didn't get in. <laughs> Got into the UC system, but not specifically UCLA, but didn't mention her mom as Carol Burnett. <laughs> Right. You know, and I was saying in my case, I was second in my class. I got into Stanford and Notre Dame, but I didn't get into Yale because, my, you know, I didn't know anyone that went there and nobody, I didn't know any big donors or anything like, and we were laughing and my dad ran for vice president, but Chris said, well, if maybe if he won, he would have gotten in. <laughs> but, you know, seriously, like we all know, right. how privileged do you have to be? You got to be a Bush or a Kushner or a Trump apparently and give that kind of money. And it, it, how is that fair? Yeah, in fact, in that complaint you just read from, they cite some statistics. Again, it'll have to bear out. They'll have to do some fact-finding to see if this is true. But the allegation says that a typical student has a 3% chance of getting admitted. If you are the child of a donor or a legacy, that goes up by six to seven times. So instead of a 3% chance of being admitted, you now have a 20% chance of being admitted if you are in one of these protected categories. And who is it that gets protected in that way? The wealthy, the privileged those who can make a donation and those whose parents or grandparents went to these schools before you. So I I think that this is um, a a very strong challenge and uh, I'll be curious to see what defenses are raised, but it's hard to imagine a defense that demonstrates that this is somehow an educational necessity. Yeah. Let's talk about student loans for a minute. So within hours of the Supreme Court striking down his student debt forgiveness plan, Biden announced a new path he will use in an attempt to turn his promise to provide debt relief to millions of Americans into a reality. It would uh, instead rely on provisions in a different law called the Higher Education Act. It would give the power to the Secretary of education to forgive these loans. Um, Biden insisted his strategy is legally sound, but cautioned it will take longer to implement than the original plan because they'll have to go through a lengthy federal rulemaking process. I mean, a lot of people, of course, Barbara, are saying, as President Biden said, this is not a normal court. And a lot of people are saying it, the conservative justices will find any excuse to reject a Democratic priority they dislike, whatever the legal reasoning is. Do you feel like this plan B has any better chance? Yeah, I don't know, because as you say, it it does really feel like this court is very uh, results driven. For example, you know, this is the majority of the court uh, uh, ascribes to this textualist theory that we just read the words. We don't look to the intent or the words as they were meant at the time of the reading. We don't put any modern gloss on it. What the law says is that the secretary of education may modify or waive the repayment of student loans during a time of national emergency. Here, the Secretary of Education said, COVID-19, this is a national emergency. I am going to um, modify loans and allow students to forgive up to $20,000 for certain incomes, $10,000 for other incomes and the like. And they said, you know, modify. When they said modify, I don't think they really meant modify. What it really meant was modest modify. And because this is such a large modification, this can't be what they meant when they said modify. And, yeah. you know, the response by the Biden administration was, but it says wave. They can wave it all together. Yeah, yeah. wave and cancel are different things. So I don't think so. Well, I mean, it Barbara- really feels like they're just being too cute by half and striking down this program um, in, in the face of language that seems to permit it. Yeah. Well, Barb, again, it seems once again, voting in Congress yeah. is the only remedy. <laughs> we're going to have here. Talk to us about this this fictional gay website case, which <laughs> none of us seem to understand. I know Rachel Bittekoffer, I think, tweeted you and said, Barb McQuaid, how? How does this get all the way to the Supreme Court when they don't have standing? Right? I mean, this is fictional. How did this happen? Can you explain? Yeah, so this is the uh, 303 Creative versus Elena's case you're talking yep. about, yeah. the, yep. uh, yeah. the, the, the website. You know, this one strikes me, actually, although I think... Again, this is policy masquerading as law when they are discriminating against people. There's a there's a a Colorado law that says that LGBT community is protected from discrimination in places of public accommodation. Businesses cannot discriminate on that basis. That strikes me as a compelling governmental reason that's narrowly tailored that require anyone who opens their doors to do business to do business with minorities, religious groups and members of the LGBTQ community. 
I am less troubled on the standing issue, I think, than other people are, because I think this is what is sometimes referred to as a pre-enforcement action. Because it is state action, a person could have the chilling effect. Um, I don't want to run afoul of the law, so I'm going to file a lawsuit to get an opinion uh, before I actually suffer injury. When it's the state that is enforcing a law that's actually permissible. In fact, it was the absence of that state enforcement that I think really rankled me and others when Texas pre-Dobbs passed that law about the Texas heartbeat law yeah. uh, that made it illegal to perform abortion services after six weeks or so of, um, of from conception. And the, the, the workaround they did there was instead of making it enforceable by the state, which would permit pre-enforcement action and uh, perhaps get it struck down, they made it only um, allowable by private action. So an individual yeah. could sue someone on that basis. So when you have the state, as we do in this Alenis case, uh, as the enforcer out there, the worry is it could have a chilling effect even before uh, you you are injured. So yeah. I have less of a problem with that, but I still have a problem on the merits of this decision, yeah. which really says um, I can close my doors, even though I've opened to others, based on my religious view that your marriage is, quote, false. Well, you had a great tweet. I have a religious objection to bigots. Can I deny yeah. now deny them <laughs> services, too? I mean, and by the way, you made a great point about voting as well. You said uh, if there's a silver line to the student loan ruling and also this one, you know, uh, it, it's likely to have the effect of getting out the student vote. I mean, this quote about that, the Congress uh, could pass a law that does exactly what Biden's executive order pretended to do if their bill really is that popular. Either they can pressure enough Republicans to flip or they can do enough Republicans for opposing it and take back Congress immediately pass their bill in January 2025. I mean, the only good news that happened is God bless voting rights and Neil Katyal, right? I mean, it just seems like that's the only way we're going to be able to address a lot of this is by voting, right? I mean, the president said, I mean, the president can't expand the Supreme Court, but Congress can, right? Yeah, and I, and I think the one good news from last week from the Supreme Court was that Moore versus Harper case where the majority rejected that independent state legislature theory, which was a very terrifying possibility that a state legislature could simply overrule the votes of a state and impose their own slate. You know, this was part of the uh, Jeffrey Clark, uh, Donald Trump plot to steal the election. It would make that permissible. So at least that got beaten back. You know, there's still partisan gerrymandering out there that is skewing election results. There's still voter suppression laws that are making it difficult for young people and minorities to vote. Uh, but um, as you just said, I, I think one of the things we saw post Dobbs here in my home state of Michigan was voters were highly motivated on the question of abortion after Dobbs. Yeah. Uh, Michigan passed a constitutional amendment to permit abortion. Um, and for the first time in 40 years, Democrats took the House and the Senate in the yes. state. We could see a similar, you know, young, nothing will mobilize young people like taking away their student loan forgiveness. Yes. So it could oh. be the same backlash nationally, I think. Let's get to the fun stuff about Donald Trump going to prison before we go. <laughs> I saved the best for last. It's like dessert. Um, you, <laughs> a, m a bunch of tantalizing tweets of yours. You said uh, reports indicate Jack Smith is focusing on Trump's lawyers in the J6 probe. Um, you said in the Mar-a-Lago indictment, Trump's best defense is likely delay. Watch for the tell, what we call oceans of motions. Um, you said if Jack Smith has not already interviewed for former Arizona Governor Ducey, you can bet he's typing up the subpoena now. More evidence of conspiracy to defraud the United States. It it sure feels like we're going to warp speed on both of these cases. Where, where do, Where's your take on where we are now in documents and J6? Yeah, in some ways, it was an unfortunate distraction for Jack Smith to have to work on this Mar-a-Lago case. I mean, an important case, <laughs> yeah. but something he needed to work through. But it seems that now that that case is under indictment, he is really um, accelerating the investigation. And, you know, we only know what's publicly reported. There's likely lots of other stuff occurring below the surface. Um, but the fact that they've had Meadows into the grand jury, they've had Mike Pence into the grand jury, and now they seem to be looking at the fake electors and some of the lawyers. Um, you never know how much is next. You know, even in my own cases, people would ask me, when are you going to indict this case? I, said, I don't know. I get it. I, you know, every time you talk to a witness, there might be one more. You know, they might tell you about five more witnesses that you have to talk to. Yeah. But um, it does seem like they have uh, very solid evidence to prove um, a theory of conspiracy to defraud the United States. That is interfering with a function of government, the lawful uh, transition of presidential power by means of fraud, lying to the public about uh, a stolen election. And so it, it strikes yeah. me as a good theory there 
but when they're, I don't know when they'll be yeah. done gathering all the evidence. Yeah. Um, last one, real quick. You said his former U.S. Attorney Rudy Giuliani knows federal cases are ma- how they're made. His proffer is the first step toward exploring cooperation and a plea agreement. There is no honor among thieves. What can you explain? What is a proffer? What is yeah. happening with him? So a proffer is kind of the first step toward exploring a cooperation and plea agreement. Lawyers, uh, prosecutors don't want to um, uh, promise leniency or uh, declining charges uh, in a vacuum. They want to know what the person can deliver. So it's sort of like taking a car for a test drive. I want to hear what you say before I promise you anything. So come in. I promise I won't use anything you say against you in this one meeting and tell me everything you know and everything you're able to tell me. Uh, that would be a value to me as a prosecutor in prosecuting other people. Mo- he met with them for eight hours. Most often when someone comes in and has that conversation, uh, you know, especially someone in Rudy Giuliani's position, prosecutors hear some things that sound valuable. And they say, all right, uh, we will agree to a cooperation deal. You must plead guilty, but we will uh, seek leniency with the judge up to and including probation, depending on what you are allowed able to deliver. So it sounds like they're working down that path. And I think Rudy knows where the bodies are buried. 